Hello there, and welcome to Nero Baptist Church. Um, in this morning's service, we um, shared communion together, and uh, we also heard from Emma Walsh, um, an ex-member of the church here, who's now back in uh, her native land of Australia, in the Northern Rivers region. Um, and she told us about uh, a new uh, church plant that she set up that's working with um, L- the LGBTQ community there. And uh, she told us about how it's, how it's bringing together uh, people who have really had a, a rough ride in um, the very conservative uh, Baptist churches and other churches in, in that region. Um, and it is providing a place of welcome and sanctuary. We also um, heard from the, the Gospel of John, and it was chapter 2, um, and uh, the verses were uh, 13 to 22. So it was John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, and um, I shared the sermon that I'm going to share with you now. So in the Gospel reading, we come across Jesus um, emptying the temple. Uh, the temple courtyard of, of the money changers of the of the people who were selling animals for sacrifice. It's a very striking image for seemingly angry Jesus, as he creates a makeshift whip, cleanses the temple of the merchants, drives out the beasts they were selling, overturns the tables of the money changers, sends coins scattering everywhere. You know, in the days approaching Passover, the Jewish people would go to Jerusalem to purify themselves at the temple, to put things right with God, usually by offering a sacrifice. Now, in some sense, there's a bit of a resemblance to the time that we find ourselves in now, as we prepare for Easter in this period of Lent. Yes, we don't make animal sacrifices in quite the same way, but we might be aware of the many people who make quite a good business out of writing Lenten reflections and selling Lent books and the like. And it's this holy process of preparation that Jesus interrupts in such a dramatic fashion as he drives these business folk out of the temple. Now, Ched Myers, in his work, points out that as the temple becomes a marketplace, that access to forgiveness and purification, access even to God's favour, becomes something that is only for the privileged ones who can afford it. A barrier is put in place that prevents access to God. Some who would seek to take part in the festival are priced out of it, as if you're poor, the sacrifice that can be made is proportionately extortionate, and the sacrifice is very small in terms of the animal that is sacrificed, of course. Alongside of this, there's no guarantee that those who can afford to make a good sacrifice and even show these sacrifices do so with any degree of penitence. Their hearts can remain unchanged, but they could still seem outwardly righteous in the eyes of the community. Jesus then makes it clear that the temple is no fit place for such a marketplace. Access to God is not to be limited in such a way. Contextually, we might also consider that the temple at this time was viewed as being a compromised organisation, in a sense. The religious leaders were seen as being too close to the Roman rulers. Some of the money from the temple and the businesses in the courtyard was going to Rome. The temple and its leaders were caught up in the structures of empire and in the oppressive control that it enforced. As far as the Gospel of John is concerned, Jesus interrupts all of what is going on to make a point. And the point that he's making is that God is present with them through him. That he is with them regardless of what's going on at the temple and that God has broken out beyond the boundary of the inner temple walls. His presence is no longer for the chosen few amongst the priesthood, if it ever was just for them at all. Righteousness is no longer for the wealthy, but all who can see Jesus for who he is. All who believe can receive salvation through him. 
access to God, redemption, forgiveness, eternal life, is not limited then by the sacrificial business centre at the temple. All of these things are with them quite literally in that moment as Jesus stands amongst them. The irony, of course, is that they cannot see it. They don't recognise the light of the world. They're so caught up in preparing for Passover in the way that they always did that they notice the disruption that Jesus brings and they ask for a sign that it's justified, but they don't seem to understand the response. God is present with them in Jesus. As Jesus is killed, the temple will be destroyed. As he's buried and then raised again, the temple is rebuilt. Now, there's no wonder that they don't understand this at this point. Um, It is all quite cryptic, really. Even the disciples only get it as they look back and remember what Jesus said. It's only in hindsight that they join the dots together. Now, in this time of lockdown when we're separated from our own lovely place of worship that you can see behind me. In Christ, we find words of encouragement today because God's presence with us is not limited to the church on Bond Square, just as it was not limited to the temple. Lovely and important as the church building is to us, God's presence is actually made known to us in Christ's ongoing presence within us. And as the Holy Spirit fills us, It's made known through the love and friendship that we share with others, those who reveal to us the presence of God. And these words also should be words of encouragement for those who seek after Christ beyond the confines of the established church. For those who've come across boundaries that restrict their inclusion, who found the demands of controlling and blinkered church cultures too much to bear, It's a reminder that no one form of church, no authority figure, no matter how revered, can claim to provide sole access to salvation in Jesus Christ. For the presence of God cannot ever be contained in such a way. For Christ himself is the temple. No place and no person is beyond his reach. Christ is present in this world. The Spirit of God continues to be poured out shining light in places of darkness, breathing new life in new and unexpected ways. Sometimes in spite of the best intentions of local churches who have sought to monitor access to the good news that Jesus brings. Of course at New Road Baptist Church, we take great pride in our inclusivity, in our welcome to different people, regardless of social background regardless of nationality even australians and the welsh are welcome here regardless of ethnicity regardless of sexuality or gender you will all find a welcome here and this is a good thing yet we shouldn't lose sight of the christ who dwells amongst us and challenges the ways in which we place limits still on the love, grace, mercy and forgiveness that we ourselves know in Christ. We still need to stay aware to the many barriers that are so easily put in place, often subconsciously, that prevent people from encountering the redemptive love of Christ in our midst. Even if we think about how we meet through this time of pandemic, even though we've gone to great lengths to try and include everyone in the congregation, It still requires the privilege of good internet or phone access. It requires the money to pay for the phone and broadband and electricity bills. It requires knowledge of the Zoom link if you're joining us live. It demands also not having to work on a Sunday morning, a privilege that not all experience. Beyond that, of course, there's barriers of language, culture and content Then, if we think structurally, Baptist churches tend to have a boundary put in place when it comes to membership. Of course, um, in some ways that's with good reason, in that all people who share faith in Jesus Christ 
are invited to covenant with us and to join in membership in such a way. Yet we realise that these things are, are barriers and boundaries that we might not be able to overcome, but we can mitigate for their effects. And some of the boundaries, of course, we might choose to keep, but we should at least make sure that we take stock from time to time to ensure that there's no limits that are in place that have been overlooked. Ways in which our behaviour has become exclusive or things that have crept into church life that might prevent us from seeing Christ amongst us when he comes to disrupt our long-established traditions and to point us in a different direction. This time of Lent and this period in the coming year as we hopefully at some point resume our physical gatherings in the centre of Oxford will provide us anew with an opportunity to take stock and a reminder to keep our eyes open for where Christ is at work. For we know that our society, our community, our city will be different in light of all that we've experienced such that to be a part of God's kingdom work in Oxford might well look different to how it did before the pandemic struck. Yet, this need to discern the call of Christ anew in our ever-changing world is nothing new in itself. It's always been a necessity, even if more often than not we prefer to stick with what we know. Thankfully, though, God's love Grace and mercy is not bounded by our own limited vision. In our service this morning, we shared communion together. Communion uh, being the means by which we remember God's grace. And we remember the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross before his resurrection on the third day. Now this is, of course, um, communion has been one of the most bounded activities in Christian life. Access to the table of the Lord has been controlled in all sorts of ways through the centuries. Yet today, as we gathered online, we found that the bread and the wine, these symbols of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, even these are not bounded by the walls of the church as they are present in each of our homes, at each and every table of varying shapes and sizes. Each uh, one of these tables has served today as the table of the Lord, a meal to which all those who believe even a little have been invited to share, such that wherever you are, no matter what time zone you are in, Christ is present with you. As we share in his presence, we find ourselves dwelling in the temple of the Lord our God. Now may you all know that you are welcome there, that Christ calls you into his presence. And as we share together in worship, as we've shared in communion, we are joined together by the Spirit of God. Now in the coming uh, days and and weeks, may more of God's redemptive and restorative work in this world be revealed to you as you spend time in the presence of Christ, in the temple of God. Amen.